If you have your Bibles this morning, would you open them with me to Acts chapter 2? Uh, today is Pentecost Sunday, and we uh, are going to be talking about Pentecost and what it means and this spirit-filled believer and baptism in the Holy Spirit. So if you brought a friend and, and uh, they came to church today and you're just hoping that pastor won't talk about speaking in tongues, well, I'm sorry, we're going to be talking about speaking in tongues. <laughs> So nobody leave. You know, we're not going to tell you to say Honda, go buy a bow tie if you want to buy a Honda really fast. That's not going to happen, all right? <laughs> Nothing strange. Nobody's going to push you over. Or, but we are going to trust God for his gift. Amen? And it is, it is something that God desires for us to seek, his touch from his Holy Spirit. So let's get into his word. Acts chapter 2. Let's read all the way down to verse 11. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came in from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Perga and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and it's significant in meaning, maybe more than we realize. The simple definition of what Pentecost is, a Pentecost means 50, or 50 days. It's the 50th day after Passover. And so Pentecost in the Old Testament was called the Feast of Weeks as well. Pentecost is a celebration of the harvest. It's um, significant. Uh, the, the Bible tells us in Exodus to celebrate the feast of harvest or the first fruits of, crop, of our crops. Um, so there were seven weeks of harvest to Pentecost. Then the day after that, or Passover, from Passover, and the day after that was considered Pentecost. So 49 plus 1, 50. This was a celebration that God commanded them to do, to celebrate the ingathering. And so Pentecost came after the observance of Passover, but it came before the Feast of Tabernacles. And these three, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, were the major three feasts that that God commanded for Israel to observe. And of course, we know Passover is a celebration of God's deliverance out of the land of Egypt and his hand over them and keeping them. The Feast of Tabernacles was in late September, uh, early October on our calendar, an eight-day celebration where they lived in tabernacles, and it's a celebration of God's providing and caring for them in the wilderness. And as we saw in the last couple weeks from Hebrews and Colossians, these things aren't uh, things necessarily that we uh, participate in or celebrate necessarily anymore. It's not bad to celebrate them, but they are just typical of Jesus. They, They represent types of Jesus. They are an illustration of who Jesus is and what he became and who he was. Um, The Passover, of course, the the sacrificial lamb was shed and the blood was applied to the doorpost. The blood of Jesus was shed. The Feast of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Feast of Provision, which we're going to be talking about today, the tabernacle, that God is our provider. And all of these things have a typology, if you will, or or a significance about Jesus. Pentecost was celebrated by eating the first fruits of their end gathering. It was a big feast. They ate till their stomachs were full. That is what Pentecost was. They, they, they did that. Isaiah 44.3 gives a prophecy about Pentecost. and I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. So as they're celebrating the Feast of Pentecost, Jesus tells them to go wait. And they're in this upper room together as we read. And it's the significance of Pentecost and the fullness of it and and the feast of Pentecost is so typified in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. God's Holy Spirit is poured out on this place just as Isaiah prophesies here and they were in this place together and there's some things that they did and I want to just kind of dissect that. We got three parts today. We're going to talk about what they did its significance. We're going to talk about what God did and his significance in that and then we're going to be talking about the participation that they had in that. So first of all, what did they do together? They were in the upper room together and they were praying together. 
You heard Pete talk about it this morning. That praying has a lot of benefits, especially praying together. Number one, praying together invites a presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 6 and 7, we see Solomon dedicating the temple. The Bible said when the whole assembly of Israel was standing there, Solomon prays this prayer, this dictatorial prayer that, that God uh, receive this offering. May your ears be open and attend to our prayers that are offered in this place. Lord, we desire for you to hear um, our voice today. We, we love you. We, we want uh, your presence more than anything. And the Bible tells us in chapter 6 there, later on, that the presence of God entered that place in dynamic power. And because they were praying together. And we, say the, we see the same thing on Pentecost. They were in this upper room. They were praying together. They were all in one place, 120. The Bible says about 120 gathered in a room. And as they were praying, God does something powerful. He does something miraculous. He does something that they, they already believe in him. They are already saved. They already trust him. It was something, the first step that they already took. They were going to heaven, but Jesus told them, I have something more for you. Praying together is also increases the faith of the congregation to believe God for the miraculous. In Matthew chapter 17 and Mark chapter 9, it tells a story about the uh, boy being brought to Jesus and the, the parents said, you know, Jesus, the disciples, your disciples couldn't cast the devil out of this kid. And, and Jesus prays this simple prayer and, and, and the devil leaves, the, the demonic leaves him. And, and so they, they come to, to Jesus, the disciples later, and say, why couldn't we do this? And what does he say? Because you lack faith. Your faith wasn't built up enough. How did he say? Because it comes by prayer and fasting. Your desire to do this was great. And this was interesting because it came after he had sent them out two by two and they come back celebrating, Lord, even the demons obey us. They're already, so, but Jesus said there's something more. And what happens is that, that God desires for people to pray together, to pray and seek God together as a congregation, as a unit. It's easy on Sunday mornings when we come together, there's somebody preaching, there's songs being sung, there's something happening. People come for that, but when you call a prayer meeting, it's a little bit more difficult to get people to come out. And I think part of the reason is that maybe we don't understand the significance and power when we pray together. When we pray together, something great happens. I often encourage people, when you're praying for someone, as we gathered here at the front at the altars or, or some other thing, God, you know, I encourage you to pray out loud. Because when people hear you pray, what does it do? It encourages their faith. When you hear somebody else pray, it also teaches you how to pray, right? You hadn't thought of that thing before. Thirdly, praying together moves people from seeking their own purposes to God's purposes. When you're in your prayer closet or you're praying on your own, oftentimes, God, you know, have mercy on me, O oh God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgression, crying out to God, maybe. God, I need provision for this. I need healing for this relationship. I need, I need this or that. But when we're praying together, something dynamic happens. Sure, we might pray for ourselves, but we hear others praying and we hear, we hear their needs and we begin to pray for each other. And we begin to be interested in what something else, what is happening in somebody else's life. And, and by praying together, <clears throat> we're encouraged to participate in their life. We're encouraged to, to pray for them. So God desires us to move into that situation. Most people, we, we pray, we pray, Lord, fix my own situation. God, you know, that ornery neighbor, you know, get rid of them. Call bears out from the wild wilderness and devour them, do something. <clears throat> but when we pray together... We're interested in our friend's neighbor. We're interested in our friend's needs. We're interested in, in Jesse's needs and, and Pandora's needs and Mike's needs. We're, we're interested in that. And so we begin to pray together and it develops a move away from the selfish or just our purposes to God's purposes, to the people's purposes. And fourthly, of course, unity. The scripture says they were together in one accord. And again, it doesn't mean one Honda. It means they were in one accord. They were in one unified purpose. They had one goal, and that goal was to seek God. Jesus said, go and wait for the promise of the Father, and what did they do? They went together, and they waited for the promise of the Father. I can imagine in this room today, just shy of 200 chairs, as we're all gathered here, and, and all of you are here, and you're, as we seek God together, if we were to ask God, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit, have your way in me, if we were all that desirous and had that, that unction, that passion in our lives, that God would do it. Because the Bible says God will answer, his, answer prayer, a prayer effort in faith, if we believe that he will do that. The, the, the second thing that happened that they did, they prayed together. 
They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were baptized in or with the Holy Spirit. The Bible uses very careful language here. There's a lot of different opinions about baptism in the Holy Spirit. How many have heard different opinions? Okay, there's lots of waving, some hands. I'm not sure if I should raise my hand. Was that a yes or no? If I raise my hand, am I wrong? No. We've heard lots of opinions about baptism in the Holy Spirit, right? We've heard the opinion that baptism is at salvation. So when I'm saved, the Holy Spirit comes in me and I'm baptized and it's all in one shot. And that was my baptism in the Holy Spirit. Or it was only to start the church, you know, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit came in that place in the upper room and they're all 120 of them singing glory to God or they're worshiping Jesus or they're praying. They got Shane up there in the guitar, you know, and Roy playing the drums and everybody's just like, Jesus! And, and, and all that happens and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes and, and uh, the, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit and they first start speaking in tongues and, and miracles start happening and all this incredible stories come out of the early church, right? Amazing stuff powerful stuff, that that was just God's shock and awe. <laughs> to just start the church, you know. It was just for a short time. It was, it was, it was called, these people are called cessationalists with a C. They, 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 they believe that the, the gifts of the Spirit or the work of God ceased after the early church. And I don't find any scriptural precedent for that. But they say that the work of God in this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, was, was, was just for that time. It was all of those things, tongues and every, the prophecy and all that stuff came out. It was just for the early church. Others believe that you are not saved unless you speak with tongues. Boy, that's dangerous. Look at the scripture and, and then you, we can make up our own mind. So let's do that. That's really important. This is something for us to seek God for. It's his gift. Let's look, Luke 24, 49, Jesus said this. These are his words. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Who said this? Jesus said this. Was he talking to people that were unsaved? No. Point number one. Acts 1.4, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Who's speaking? Jesus. And he is telling them, I want you to go and wait for the promise of, the, that, of my father. I want you to wait. They were already saved. The disciples were already believing in Jesus, right? They had already accepted Jesus. They were going to heaven. They, I, I want us to take time to erase some confusion that many uh, have concerning baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's confusing in the meaning of the baptisms. And, and I've, I think we've done this illustration before a little bit, but I don't want to rehearse at least one part of it. The Bible tells us, number one, that we are baptized in the, into Jesus by the Holy Spirit. The Holy, well, another way to, I think it might be on your outline this way, the Holy Spirit baptizes us in Jesus. Take a look at this scripture with me. The Bible says in Matthew, or is it there? First Corinthians, sorry, I'm in the next one already. By one spirit you are baptized into one body. I don't think there's any theologian or grammatical person on earth who could misinterpret what it's saying here. By one spirit, we were baptized into one body. That body being the body of Christ. So the Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. In fact, let's write it that way. Holy Spirit baptizes us, P, us, and Jesus. Number two, Disciples baptize in water. Forgive my penmanship. I'm a doctor, right? 
So disciples, we, we come to Christ. What do we do for one another? We're here. We have the baptismal tank. We baptized seven people that not, long, not that long ago here up here, and it was very exciting. And what do we do? Disciples, people that know Christ, baptize people. I wasn't the only one baptizing. We had a couple dads baptizing their kids. We, had, <clears throat> we can have other people that are believers in Jesus, but these people are already believers in Jesus. They've been saved, and because they're following Jesus, God has given them this ability because they're believing that God is going to baptize them in the the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So they baptize in water. But thirdly, Jesus, oh, let's look at that. I have a scripture for that one? Yeah, there we go. You know it by heart, right? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. I quoted that. Okay, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit. The Bible makes this clear. Let's go to the next one, Matthew 3.11. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, who is he? Jesus. Really? Very careful. Now, a lot of the confusion, I think, comes in there's a lot of different denominational groups, and there's many that believe you're baptized in the Holy Spirit when you were saved, but that's not what the Bible says. You can look this up principally, and grammatic, grammatically it just makes sense, but theologically, it makes very much sense, right? Because we understand that we're born into the body of Christ, we're going to heaven. You don't have to be baptized in water first. You don't have to speak in tongues first to go into heaven. We're baptized by the Holy Spirit into Jesus, into the family of God. We are baptized by disciples, which we should all do once we come to know Christ as an illustration of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection uh, by disciples. And then we're baptized by Jesus in the Holy Spirit. The Bible makes this very clear. I think it's important for us to understand the, the first baptism and the, the difference between the first and third baptism. The, the careful way that the, the, the Word of God says that he will baptize us with the Spirit. The first one's talking about the Spirit baptizing us for salvation. The other one is talking about Jesus baptizing us in the Holy Spirit. Now, here's what gets me in two ways. These two are, are, are not the same. They are very different theologically. They are very different grammatically. So notice the he, Jesus, will baptize you with the Spirit, and then he will do this for us. This is something that God does. Baptism to the Holy Spirit, then, is subsequent to salvation. You don't do number three before you do number one, right? And we don't do number two before we do number one, right? And we can be, I've seen people number one, then jump right to number three. I've seen that. But I have never seen it the other way. It doesn't work. You have to be a follower of Jesus, a, a disciple. You have to be someone who is wanting, it, who is born into the kingdom of God. So it's subsequent to our salvation experience. Acts 19, Paul first explained that they were to believe on Jesus. Once they did, they were baptized in water. And after they were baptized in water, they, they, he put his hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The Bible says the Holy Spirit came on them. First they believed, then they were baptized in the Spirit. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 and 2 says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples. He asked him, Did you receive the Holy Spirit since you believed? Since you believed? No, we haven't heard. Well, let me tell you. The Bible says that he prayed for them and they received the Holy Spirit. They had to hear in that instance. They began to speak in tongues. Thirdly, the third thing that they did was they, had, they spoke in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, people have questions about speaking in tongues, and it seems pretty radical for today's day, even a little crazy. And aren't there people just out of control? You know, they're just whacked out, and, and there are people. And there's been abuses of this. I mean, all you have to do is watch Christian television all the time sometimes. I think there's four or five shows in a row that you can watch, and it's abused, right? It's sold. It's pro tongues is almost prostituted. It's given for your donation. But it's criticized by some pretty predominant church denominations and leaders as well, individuals of popular church church leaders, and, um, you know, John MacArthur, he's a big one that uh, wrote a book even called Strange Fire. The whole book made me angry. I have read it, though. <laughs> it's about uh, the cessationless idea that these things aren't for the church today. So the idea is out there, but it seems to be so contradictory to what God's Word says. You know, my experience was when I was a young man, I, I came to know Christ at an early age. My mom led me to the Lord in our dining room, at the dining room table, and I went to camp.
And my camp was my first, even though I had been in church, um, being in that environment or something, as a kid in fifth grade, I went to kids camp, and I had this experience with God at the altar, and I couldn't contain it. I, I felt like I was going to explode, and, and, and they had talked about baptism in the Holy Spirit, and as I was seeking God there and praying and tears rolling down my eyes, wanting everything that God had for me, I just began to say, okay, God, whatever you have, and I began to just say some things, and, and after a while, it erupted because I took that first step It was me doing it, but it was the spirits moving in my life. So what does the Bible say about speaking in tongues? Since it's such a a thing, maybe with some people, there's three specific things that are mentioned, and there's a couple more, but I'm going to talk about three big things and the reasons for speaking in tongues. Number one, the practice of praying or in private, praying in the spirit. This is private. Practice of praying in the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.26 tells us when we don't know what to pray, the Holy Spirit prays through us with groans that cannot be understood. And the Bible also says in uh, 1 Corinthians 14.4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Have you ever considered that? That when you are praying in the Spirit and when you are praying in tongues, you're edifying yourself. And that is not considered a bad thing in this instance because the Holy Spirit is speaking in you. He's working in you. When we pray in the Spirit in tongues, we are encouraged. We are lifted up. The Bible says that this is an important thing and it's a practice that every believer has the opportunity to be a part of. This is something that should be a part of the believer's life, that praying in the Spirit is an interaction with the Holy Spirit. So speaking in tongues, as Paul writes, is something that can come out privately in your personal prayer life. Another reason for the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues and interpretation. Now, this is not private. This is open to edify the whole church. Okay, pastor, this is where it gets weird. It's where it kind of blows me out of the water. Maybe it gets a little strange. How many were not raised in a Pentecostal church? Go ahead. That's the majority of the people in this room. I recognize this as your pastor. I, I know most of you, so it's, it's, that's the way. And you know that we are, and at some point in your life, you've crossed over, or your wife had been dragging you to church for years here, and you, you didn't really want to go. But that pastor guy talking about tongues on Sunday morning. This is a taboo subject for Sunday morning, even in Assembly of God pulpits. I'll tell you, it's not that taught that much anymore. It's just sad. I agree. I think in some senses that in this culture today and, and by the, the way that um, other doctrines might cast such dispergents on it, it makes it sound weird. However, God is normal. I am abnormal. God's the sane one in this room. The rest of you are crazy just like me. We're wayward, we're far from God, we walk from God, we doubt, we fear, we have all these things that encroach in our life, and yet God is still God, and he still says the same thing. His word never fails, his word never changes. And I agree that it's been abused in the church. There may have been some that you have seen on television or whatever, and Heard people say that this is my gift and I want to exercise or this, that's your gift and this is my gift and I have to do this or, and, and that it's been abused where, where people are, are led and they're given words to say and all these kinds of things, right? But that is not the purpose of the three purposes that, that, that the scripture gives us for tongues. This one right here is the most interesting because it involves the whole group. It's open. I mean, the first one is personal, right? It's for personal prayer. Paul writes it very clearly that he who prays in a tongue edifies himself. He says, I'd rather speak, you know, a a thousand words in a regular tongue that people could understand than than something nobody understands. In other words, it was for him privately. He He knew and understood this. But this one, when it comes to this point, and we look at this very clearly, that it is for the edification of of God's people in the church, we kind of get a little freaked out. So let's look again at what God's word says. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 13 through 17, it says this. Therefore, let no one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Let him who speaks in a tongue, excuse me. For I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. What do you think that means? It means he's praying words and singing words that he doesn't understand. 
Now, how many in this room have been baptized in the Holy Spirit and you have spoken in tongues? Go ahead. Okay, a little more than half. The rest of you, it's not a dispersion on you or anything. I'm just saying, and we're talking about this this morning because I believe that God wants to give this gift to everyone. If God has given us so much instruction in his word about this and so carefully, then this is something that God says is a gift that I want to give to you and I want you to have it and I want you to practice it. It must be important. He goes on and says, if I, if I do this, he says, and, and, and see with the understanding of verse 16, otherwise if you bless with the spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he doesn't understand what you say? For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. In other words, if I stood up here for 40 minutes and preached a sermon and I spoke in tongues the whole time, it wouldn't do anybody any Lincoln good. Everybody go, what in the world was that? Right? I went to church today and the pastor was up there and he was just speaking in tongues. I didn't even understand a thing that he said. That wasn't really very helpful. But he says that this is important because it is for your personal edification but if the tongue is interpreted, it is for the whole congregation. Notice the gift of the tongue is intended not just to, uh, to, to just for the person, but it's intended in that sense in the corporate gathering if it's given for, as he says, to edify, the word edify, the whole church, to encourage, to lift up, to instruct. If there's no interpretation, the person speaking in tongues should be quiet. Or they should pray, as the Bible says, until they have the interpretation, therefore they can speak it themselves. Tongues and interpretation is not to be meant to be an unwelcomed interruption in, in the gatherings of God's people. But Paul says it's supposed to be done decently in order, and we have times in our service where it, during worship that we might linger or wait, and, and those are beautiful moments. Like if I'm preaching right now and all of a sudden someone stands up and speaking in tongues, that's out of order, Right? But if we're in a moment, maybe a gathering and worship in those moments, I, en I encourage that. I, I want to hear if God is speaking to us by the power of his Holy Spirit as a group for us to hear that. I believe that he's speaking to us this morning. I believe the preparation of these thoughts and words and everything that have been prayed about and studied and put together all this week have been for our hearing. And I believe that the Holy Spirit speaks the same way through people. Tongues and interpretation is not meant to be unwelcome. 1 Corinthians 14, 18 says, I thank God that I speak more than all of you. But in church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Paul makes it clear that when he's with the church in a gathering in a worship setting, he'd rather, you know what, say things in an understood language by everyone. He goes on in chapter 14, and I want to, it's quite lengthy, but I want to read it. Uh, let's do it, verse 23. It says, so if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some do not understand it, and some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Now, doesn't this happen when you see it on television? I wonder why. Because they're unbelievers, right? You're out of your mind. For the Christian, that we may understand what may be happening, we have grace and we have patience in those settings, but in the corporate setting, he said, unless there's an interpretation, it doesn't do any good. But he says, if an unbeliever or someone comes in that does not understand well, everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he's a sinner and be just judged by all because they're saying words in, in, in the language that is understood. They're, they're speaking in our situation English. Or Espanol, if you're so inclined so that, that we understand what's being said. Thirdly, tongues was a physical evidence of baptism in the Holy Spirit. Let's look at this. This is where there's some contention. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, Acts chapter 10, verse 44 and 46, Acts chapter 19, verse 6, these are three of the five instances in Acts where the Bible says specifically they knew they were filled with the Spirit, for they heard them speak in tongues, and some others, and prophesy. Okay, now one of those instances we find and prophesying added because tongues and interpretation, interpretation goes with tongues in those instances, I believe. And so we have this idea that as they're gathering together and the other instances, they also were filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit, and I believe also they spoke in tongues, because of the fact that this initial evidence was apparent at these other situations. Now, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 18, it was so powerful, this giving, this baptism in the Holy Spirit, that Simon the sorcerer observes what the 
apostles are doing. They're going around praying for people, and as they're praying for people all over the place, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and Simon the sorcerer sees this, and he goes, there's something happening powerful here. People are being transformed. They're, they're speaking in tongues. They're, they're crying out to God. They're worshiping God. God is touching them. He is giving, he is empowering them. And in those situations, Simon the sorcerer, for his own selfish gain, looks back and goes, this is cool. I'm going to create a television ministry, and I am going to sell this thing. And that was his intention, although that's modern lingo. Nonetheless, that's what was in his heart. And the, the apostles knew this, and they rebuked him for it. He says, you, you, you just want this for your own gain. But there was such an observance in this man because he was the sorcerer. And then we went, when we went to this series in Acts, which you can go online and look, we looked at Simon's story. He was the leader of this town. He, was, he had the people's pocketbooks, right? And when there's competition coming in town, you can either rebel or join them. He thought, well, I'm going to try to join them. But he didn't have the power. He didn't understand what was happening. So based on these scriptures, it makes sense that speaking in tongues would be in this situation in Acts, the initial physical evidence. The book of Acts, all of these cases are um, other phenomena occurred, sound of wind, shaking places, tongues of fire. There's nothing in scripture that goes on that all of these other things continue, but tongues remain. So let's ask some common questions as a critic. Paul says, do all speak in tongues? He is saying a rhetorical question. Doesn't that imply that it's not for everyone? Well, if we turn to 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 and read them carefully, we would see that Paul makes a distinction between the gift of the Spirit in a gathering like this, speaking in tongues and interpretation, than he does with one's personal experience with tongues. Another question might be, some say it says in 1 Corinthians that that which is perfect has come, that which is temporary will fade away. And they say that he's talking about tongues, but that which is perfect is Jesus and he hasn't returned yet. Speaking in tongues should not be our primary goal when seeking baptism in the Holy Spirit. Our primary goal should be that of seeking Jesus. Jesus is the baptizer. He is the one. Speaking in tongues maybe has initial evidential value, but it is designed to, by God to be much more than evidence of a past experience. It is supposed to be something that, that goes on and on and on. Another question might be, well, wasn't tongues just for the early church at its inception? Like we said earlier, wasn't it God's shock and awe to get the church jump-started? They needed all of this stuff happening right away to draw attention to it. Wasn't it just for then? The Bible says clearly in Acts 2.39, this promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. God calls all men and women to salvation. He calls every single person on the planet. The Bible says that he is moved with compassion toward those that don't know him. He is touched, as Hebrew says, by the feelings of our weaknesses. We have a God that is so loving and so caring and so concerned about our lives. He wants everybody that he has created on this entire planet to know him. Him. That is the desire of God's heart. In fact, Scripture says he is unwilling and not wanting anyone to perish, but that all would come to repentance. That's the heart of God. So in this context, it would be clear that God calls everyone. For those that respond to the call, something happens. What was the purpose of this baptism in the Holy Spirit? Because there's a lot of people that get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Maybe they speak in tongues or had a tickle in their spine at one point and they thought it was God moving, but they walked out and they never were emboldened with power. That means their experience was experience only and it never generated, it was never generated by faith. I think that there's a lot of people that turn that corner, that we are desiring and seeking just an experience when God has in mind for continual power moving forward. 
I've often heard it said that the Holy Spirit gives us power to witness, but that is not the only thing. Look at what Acts 1.8 says. It says clearly, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and, and you'll be my witnesses. So you receive power and as a result of that power, things are gonna happen. You're gonna be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and also in Samaria, and all to the ends of the earth. So God gives us a careful, clear insight here to give us power. We've often heard it said that the Holy Spirit gives us power to witness, and that's true, but God gives this careful separation. First, he, God, he says that you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses. I think the separation is very important because of the Spirit-filled life, that there is power for life. In other words, the Holy Spirit is so affects us and so transforms our hearts it gives us power beyond what the world has the holy spirit brings a peace into a life when surrounded by difficult circumstances the holy spirit gives strength when we're striving through life under difficult choices the holy spirit gives us wisdom when we don't know what to do the holy spirit gives the life power baptism in the holy spirit goes beyond the reason that jesus said wait till you be endued with power from on high is because i have something better in life for you. I have something greater than just what you've experienced with me. Although salvation is the bomb, I've got you power to live. The Holy Spirit's power in our life is meant to be there to sustain us, to give us strength, to, to not just be an experience and then go on. And, oh yeah, I spoke in tongues, that must be it. I, I said ha ba 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 a couple times. Go buy a boat, I want to buy a Honda. Say it really fast with me and we'll be baptized. No, I didn't do it. I wasn't here for just the experience. I was here seeking Jesus and he filled me with his power. No one is going to tell us to do these things or repeat after me. What we do need to know is to realize that we need to be filled with God's spirit. When they experienced the fire, they were in a prayer meeting together seeking God. Now, there are other different circumstances they received baptism in the Spirit. At the first Pentecost, as we read here at the beginning, those who received were gathered together, apparently in prayer, and it was a group setting into which God poured out his Spirit. At Cornelius' house in Acts 10, right in the middle of Peter's preaching, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Spirit. In Ephesians 19, 6, they received baptism in the Holy Spirit through the laying on of Paul's hands. We don't want to oversimplify this process. I think sometimes we might. Because a lot of people struggle with this part of their walk with God. I have heard from many of you, even in this room, that have said, Pastor, I love Jesus. I seek God for baptism in the Holy Spirit, but I've never spoken in tongues. Does that mean I'm not baptized in the Holy Spirit? I think sometimes we make this too complicated. I think that there's a couple things that happen, and I just want to relay some of the things here that might be getting in the way of your experience that might be holding back, be held back, because of something is broken in faith. I'm not saying this is true of everybody, but I think that there's a couple things that happen. People are so focused, make it too complicated, they're trying to speak in tongues, and they think that they're doing doing it just in their own strength. And because I'm doing this in my own power, um, it must not be real. But Paul says the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. So principally, I definitely can derive from that that, that, that that we stop and start whatever we want to do. Speaking in tongues is not gib- gibberish. The Bible says that as the Spirit enabled them, now in this instance in Acts and another one, they spoke in languages that were understood because people could hear them glorifying God. But Paul also says, I will pray with, I, I, when I pray with the tongues of men and of angels. In other words, there's tongues of angels that men do not understand that, that I pray in them as well and nobody understands what's being said. And these are the instances all through Acts 12 through 14 that we find that they didn't understand what was being said because they were praying in the tongues of angels. So I want to try, you know, to get this out. I, I believe that sometimes we try so hard that we never break through. And, and so try this. I encourage, if this has been you, that 
you, you let, you start, you come out and you let a syllable even come out. I'm not telling you to practice something, but my, from my, my personal experience was when I began, the Holy Spirit just flooded through me. I took that step. I was willing to, to, to try and say, okay, God, you are touching me and I just want to praise you. And it happened in the midst of worship. So I was worshiping God and I just, I just cried out to God. I, I remember one, several years ago, we were praying for a young woman here and she said, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, I said, well, just, just receive what God has for you. And we prayed for her and she just, oh, she just it poured out of her. And she was, she was just blessed. I mean, God was working in her. I believe in this, friends. This is, I think this is a missing element today in the church. And we can, we can talk about it. We might come from different backgrounds and different churches. But if we want everything that God has for us, there is no problem asking for that. Amen. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. From my experience, when people are prepared and, and they're willing, that God gives more. It starts simple. You do your part. God did not force you to pray for salvation, did he? Come on, you know where this is going, right? He didn't force you to repent and say, Jesus, come into my life. I, I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. God, nobody forced you to do that. Nobody held your head under the water when you were baptized. Come repent, sinner. Yes, this is what I want. Does God force you to respond to conviction about sin? Or anything in his word? No. Did he force you to get saved? No. You felt the conviction of a spirit. You, you sensed the direction that he's pulling you in life, and you just simply said, yes, Lord. This is just like that. This is the spirit saying to us, the Holy Spirit desiring, and Jesus saying to us in his word, wait to be endured with power from on high. I want you to be filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit. I want to baptize you. We need to be able to say to Jesus, yes, Jesus, baptize me in your spirit. Yes, Jesus, I came to salvation. Yes, Lord, I, I came to know you because I felt the conviction and the weight of my sin. I came to know you because the burdens of life were so vast and so great. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where to turn. But you, Lord Jesus, were the one that pulled me out of the mire. You pulled me from my ways. You pulled for me from that addiction, from that sexual sin. You pulled me out of the lust from my heart or the greed of my hands. God, you pulled me from all that mess and that muck and the mire and the lies and all the grief and all the heartache. You saved me, Lord. I praise you for that. I'm going to follow your example. I'm going to love you, Lord. I'm going to follow your example. I'm going to let disciples baptize me. They're going to dunk me under the water. A representation of being dead and coming alive. Going in dry, coming out wet and feeling that I have engaged something with you about you that you also did. And now, Jesus, because you went away and said, I want you to wait to be endued with power, I don't know why anyone in their right mind would not say, yes, me too, Lord. Yes. Preach it. Preach it. I think that's number one. We make it too complicated. I think another thing is that we don't hear it practiced. We don't hear it taught. We don't hear it preached about. We preach about other problems in life and Sunday morning we come but we have three points in a poem and we, wasn't that encouraging or wasn't that nice or all oh, that, that that was sure encouraging I've heard it on the way out the door and I appreciate the compliments pastor that was so oh, that was just great I just was so encouraged today and that's all part of it but then that part comes where God says I want you baptized in the Holy Spirit and I think that we come to that point in the crossing the road and we go no way I'm not going to that tongue thing that's weird you know, I, um, it was a, a Jack Hayford years ago, and I, I've given this illustration before, but it's so funny because he's so right. He says, people come to God, and he say, God, fill me up with your spirit. So God fills them up to their knees, and they say, oh, God, that feels good. God, fill me more and more. So God fills them up to their, to their waist. God, fill me more. God fills them up to here. God, fill me more. God fills. Then they say, God, stop. I don't want to start to go gurgle, gurgle like those Pentecostals do. Why do we stop? I think we don't hear it practiced. We don't hear it preached or taught about. And we don't seek God for his gift. The meaning of the celebration of the Feast of Harvest is a perfect fit with the outpouring of the Spirit in the upper room. 
God fulfilled an illustration and in substance the meaning for the day of Pentecost, a filling up, an overflowing, a fullness, a satisfaction. Pentecost says, and they practiced it, they ate till they were full. When have you had to say to God, stop feeding me? I don't want any more. It's like setting me free at a buffet of chocolate cake. I don't want to stop. If you've ever had to say, God, stop blessing me, I want to talk to you. I need to know what's going on there. God, fill me with your spirit. I don't want us to get so distracted with tongues because we don't know what the Bible says about it. And I hope I've made a case this morning and laid it out clearly that God's power is not subject to a moment or how we feel or the swing of good music. I mean... I get moved every time. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air. That moves me. But that's not the same. Right? A filling up, an overflowing, a fullness, and a satisfaction. God's great purpose in baptism in the Holy Spirit is to fill you with his power. Thank you for watching Abundant Life Church. If you found this teaching helpful, please subscribe to our page and share us with a friend. Also, please consider giving at nwlife.org.